This meeting is being recorded. Well, good evening. My name is Antoine Dandridge. I'm the founder and creator for Black Lifestyle Advocates for Culture and Knowledge, also known as Black Organizing Fellowship Program for Planned Parenthood. Um, this program is, is in a great space for some young professionals who have an interest or an experience in organizing to come together and tackle you know, issues in the community. We host uh, virtual events that have you know, thought-provoking conversations, and we also have some live events coming up this year, but well, one in particular that we're really excited about, which is a neighborhood campus, and the area that we're looking at canvassing is South Memphis. Um, this is specifically a program for Shelby County uh, residents, but looking forward to going statewide um, throughout Tennessee uh, fall of next year. So if you have an interest in becoming a fellow, you know, definitely inbox me or you can email me. You should have my email if you've already signed up for this event. If not, I can uh, leave it at the end of the uh, presentation in the chat. And you know, we can start talking about future fellows. But in the meantime today, we are specifically excited to have a conversation about Margaret Sanger. This is a town hall event. And what we mean is that this is a localized conversation to talk about the founder of Planned Parenthood. There's always been a ton of just um, different types of, there's always been a ton of uh, different speculations about this particular person. And now we get a chance to have a deeper conversation about her and we hope to be able to answer some of your questions. If nothing else, we wanna spark some research um, in you to start researching uh, who Margaret Sanger is, learning the history about Planned Parenthood, sharing it with people who have a concern because the goal is to really reduce remove stigma through knowledge uh, and not necessarily focusing on the conspiracy theorists and the anti-Planned uh, Parenthood rhetoric who also speak heavily about uh, eugenics and, and things that was harmful to black people, but not necessarily from a space to help empower us, but to take away our rights and our uh, ability to identify with our own needs for reproductive rights and justice. So. Uh, that's a lot. So if you have questions about that, please ask me to explain. I'm glad to explain as much as possible. But for now, I actually want to move on and get started tonight. We're going to have about a, a 15 minute roundup on like a review of information or maybe less uh, from yesterday. And then we'll go right into the town hall conversation where you will become the focus of the conversation with your questions and your experiences. So uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And welcome to the Roundtable Talk. So Black Organizing Fellowship, our mission uh, is to hold a safe space for Black community activists and supporters to engage on issues and ideas relevant to the Black community. We engage, we advocate, and we learn. We embrace freedoms of Black people's opinions and ideas for greater knowledge to advance the progress of Black culture. We celebrate Black lives every time we engage. We hold ourselves accountable as advocates for all Black lives in one safe space together. Is that fair enough? All right. Next slide. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about the vision of this organization. Every organization that I think has been great organiza organizations have started with some form of a vision. So the vision of Black Lifestyle Advocates for Culture and Knowledge is to expand the capacity to organize, engage, and empower Black communities around issues centered around reproductive freedoms and intersectionality of Black lifestyles. So we are not limited to sexuality uh, because we are affiliate of Planned Parenthood. We actually talk about many things that are important to our culture, and we have a space to do that um, in our own right, independently. This organization could exist, or the like of this organization could exist with or without an affiliation of an organization like Planned Parenthood, but ideally this space works um, in continuing them in a continuation with them because of our collaboration together so uh, that's that's the vision and what we mean by capacity I mean we, we want to expand the scope of how we engage our community I don't know if a lot of you know but engaging black people around a political advocacy and freedom is a really tough thing because it's hard to mobilize us in spaces and most of our spaces that uh, hold us together are becoming dismantled uh, because of new ways of thinking and new ideas, but we have to figure out a way to get it back. So right now you mo you mobilized yourself with us tonight and we're glad that you did. We have a small crowd, but hey, small is meaningful. So a few housekeeping rules. We're gonna cultivate this safe space with our synergy. We wanna hear from you. So please raise your hand when prompted so we can hear your input. 
one speaker at a time, please. Let's be respectful to each other and mute those mics while someone else is speaking. I know y'all got kids and family and stuff happening in the background, and, and we're okay with that. But just make sure we're, we're, we're being respectful to the folks who's talking. Keep your thoughts on topic and be respectful. Um, we do tend to go a little bit off topic, by the way. We can't be mad at you about it, Maybe, mainly to respect the time of the presenters and the folks who put this together. Let's go ahead and keep our stuff, you know, in our space or whatever. Uh, disrespectful comments will be muted and removed from attendance. Self-explanatory. Each speaker will be allotted two to three minutes of speaking time. And, uh, and obviously, we would just want you to use your voice. Wait, did we lose Antoine? You see, Zoom does not want us to be great. Are you back? Okay, there you go. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, go. Okay, I got you. So last, you kind of blanked out on the last part, but just lastly, speak up. Don't oh. be shy. It's an interactive space and a safe space for us to have this conversation. Thank you, Ari. So um, not, not sure if you got a chance to attend yesterday, but we talked about the elephant in the room. I mean, if you missed yesterday's, um, yeah, if you missed yesterday's uh, presentation, I mean, you definitely missed a lot of good details. Uh, this information will be found on YouTube at a later time, but we want to kind of review this, this elephant in the room because a lot of people talk about how Margaret Sanger was part of eugenics and part of um, the speculations around well, it wouldn't have speculated. She actually did meet with the Klansmen and, you know, and but also build uh, Planned Parenthoods in Black communities to kind of, you know, build the advocacy that way. I mean, it was a lot of, you know, conflicting information that happened, but also it was also a di very difficult time uh, in history, but also one that was not favorable of Black people. And so it was very easy to err on that side, and it's not as an excuse but also it's caution that we wanna make sure that this organization, as well as many other nonprofits and for-profit businesses, err on the right side of history today, especially being that we're going through a tough time right now, i.e. the war in Ukraine. But I wanna read this elephant in the room. So this is from Margaret Sanger, and this was written in 1934. I admire the courage of government that takes a stand on sterilization of the unfit and second. My admiration is subject to the interpretation of the word unfit, if by unfit means the physical or mental defects of a human being that is an, an admirable gesture, but if unfit refers to races or religions, then that is another matter which I frankly deplore. Hmm, that last piece really, it, it does a thing to me. So basically unfit. So if there's a physical or mental dis defect of, of a child or human being, then that's an admirable gesture. That's basically an acceptable form of uh, termination. Now, how, how do we feel about that is something that I definitely, you know, we can start putting that in the chat and just really talking about what that means, um, because that's going to mean some things to us, right? Uh, refers to the races or religions that is an, in, in another, uh, which is something that she frankly deplores. So, yeah, but as Frank um, Jones, who's one of our fellows, you know, mentioned yesterday, um, African-American babies are born largely with a birth defects. So when you start talking about, you know, what, uh, what, what justifies something or what doesn't justify something, that could really be, um, you know, stuff that we can go back and look and say, hey, you said it, but you didn't say it, but you just said it in another way that we can, it's okay to kill black babies in a sense. Okay, next slide. So something else we wanna discuss is the ideology of eugenics. Um, it's inherently racist and ableist. And these, these are actually points about, um, made about eugenics and also Margaret Sanger. These comments actually come from the Planned Parenthood Federation, uh, the Black organizing uh, department there who actually made these statements. So these are not necessarily our statements, but statements that we do support. Um, the ideology of eugenics is inherently racist, racist and ableist. Planned Parenthood denounces Margaret Sanger's belief in eugenics and condemns the irreparable damage these beliefs cause to the health and lives of count countless people. However, we do need to note that Planned Parenthood is accountable for making sure that we are continuing to move, or that, that their organization continues to move in a um, in a in an equitable direction, you know, because of the history 
And as we all know, history repeats itself, right? Margaret Sanger's a race, racist ally, alliances and beliefs in eugenics, eugenics caused irreparable damage to the health and lives of countless people. At times, Sanger tried to argue for eugenics that it was not applied based on race or religion. Hmm. But in society built on the beliefs of white supremacy, physical and mental fitness are always judged based on race. Eugenics, therefore, is inherently racist, period. Period. Next. Uh, Margaret Sanger's racist alliances and beliefs in eugenics caused irreparable damage um, to health and lives of countless people at times. Sanger tried to argue for eugenics while that was not applied on based on religion, based on race to religion. But in a society built on the belief of white supremacy, physical and mental fitness are always judged based on race. Eugenics, therefore, is inherently racist. So Margaret Sanger was so intent on her mission to advocate for birth control that she chose to engage with ideologies and organizations that were explicitly ableist in white supremacist centric. In doing so, she undermined the reproductive freedoms that caused irreparable damage to health, to the health and lives of generations of black people, Latino people, indigenous people, immigrants, uh, people with disabilities, people with low incomes, and many others. So what what we mean by when when, you, when I hear this statement, this takes us back to a lot of medical practices um, that were harmful to uh, black women. Um, there were sterilization projects that happened all the way through, honestly, probably up to the 60s, maybe early 70s. Um, in fact, most recently, and maybe like some part of Mississippi, I want to say not too far from Memphis, um, there was a, a doctor who was being paid to still sterilize, you know, black women in Mississippi. And this was like, since like 2018, 2019, that I, I remember hearing this story. Um, and unfortunately, it was a, a black doctor that was being paid to do it in one of these cases. Um, so it's, it's one of those situations, where if you understand the mentality of racism, of eugenics, um, ethnic cleansing, you know, even it, it, it may come from, you know, someone else that don't look like us, but it can also very well be supported by people who look like us, who uh, deal, agree with these ideologies. People can be paid off to, you know, support things. So we have to make sure we know what this look like, which is why we're having these conversations. So we know not to support it. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we're going to follow through an email about updates from some of our events. We are behind on those. I want to let you know we've all been so busy, but we want to definitely do that. And so uh, is there a slide after this, please? Uh, no, we're going to go right into the conversation from here. OK, cool. Let's go to the conversation. Thank you, Ari. So having said that, as Ari said, we're going to move right into the town hall conversation. Let me see. I got a little few pins I need to put in. We got pins. Pins, adding some pins, get everybody square away where they need to be. All right. Make sure I'm not missing anybody. Okay, so as you can see on our, um, oh, I'm sorry, Keisha. Yes, now we balance over here. All right, so we got our fellows here. I'm actually going to unpin myself so we can see the folks that we need to really see. All right, so before us today, we have our three fellows. We have Keyshawn Pearson, we have Frank Johnson, and Ashley Jones. And we have a very special guest, Christy Taylor, Memphis own, uh, the voice of Memphis, as I like to say. Um, if you grew up in Memphis in the, in the late 90s and the early, and all throughout the 2000s, and you listen to gospel radio and urban adult contemporary radio, and maybe some talk shows here and there, you definitely heard Christy Taylor, and you know who she is. She's very special to so many of us in town. Um, tonight, Christy is here as a moderator for tonight's event and to help us, you know, carry this conversation to another level. So we want to definitely uh, tune in and see what this is going to be about now. Uh, maybe a good time to text some of your friends to come on in. But as Christy Taylor is a radio veteran, TV podcast host of the Christy Taylor Show and founder of Christy Taylor Consulting, a boutique PR agency that specializes in show development and media training. Now, beyond the accolades that includes music, film, Christy Taylor is a concerned citizen of the world who is happy to moderate tonight's town hall event. Everybody, welcome 
Chris Taylor. All right. We hear those virtual applause going on. So I want to turn this event over to Christy um, and to our guests. I'm going to invite Cam and Betty Idris and Kim. Who else we got up here? And Michelle is in the loud space. Jasmine, Ari. Um, so look, let's have a conversation. Town Hall, folks. Let's make a difference. Christy Taylor, what is well, happening? You. What has been going on? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Mr. Dandridge, for inviting me to be a part of this amazing town hall. Had a chance to sit in on last night's discussion, which I definitely found very intriguing and informative. And I plan to push buttons today. So for my fellows, I want to prepare you now uh, for, for those hard questions. And uh, just for tonight, I want you to know to make sure that you lean into defending your points and let's get down to, of course, the whole point is leading us all to research, not just this organization, but other organizations that are doing work within our community. So with that being said, I just kind of want to give everyone, for those who were not here last night, a chance to have a recap from our fellows, Ashley Jones, um, of course, Keyshawn Pearson, and Frank W. Johnson. Now, of course, he was Jones about 30 minutes ago, but uh, we're going to make it. <laughs> That was a slip of the tongue by our fearless leader, but um, uh, the right Reverend Frank W. Johnson. Uh, we want to give you a chance as fellows just to kind of, once again, just reintroduce yourself on who you are in the community and what you presented on last night. Starting with you, Ashley Jones. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here again. As mentioned before, I am Ashley Jones Lacey. I work as a registered nurse and I am a Reproductive Health Education and Advocacy Fellow. Um, last night, I pretty much gave an overview of Margaret Sanger's life, um, kind of from beginning to, we didn't really talk about end of life, but um, we kind of went through like her history, her family background. Um, one of the key things that I wanna highlight today for those that don't know, or who weren't here yesterday, I think one of the pivotal moments in Margaret Sanger's life that led her to do the work was that her mother conceived 18 times and she gave birth to 11 children. And I think um, as far as what I gave, this part of the piece that I want you all to think about because I think that was so crucial in the development of who she was and the work that she did. Um, and because of the history that her mother had, you know, she died very young. She died at 49 years old. Marguerite herself lived to be 86 years old and she passed away of heart failure. So she had a long life, but her mother did not have a long life. Um, and the part of the contribution was because of all the children that she conceived and gave birth to. But ultimately her mom did pass of tuberculosis. But I think that's the part that I really wanted to highlight because I think um, that particular piece of her history was such a vital turning point in her life and how she got to where she was and the work that she did. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. And I'll make sure I keep my mic hot. <laughs> All right. Our second fellow, Kashan Pearson, um, introduce yourself and also what you presented on yesterday. Hey, everybody. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Keyshawn Pearson. I am the economic equity advocate uh, as a part of the fellowship. Um, and what I reviewed yesterday uh, was a lot of the policies that shaped the society that uh, Margaret Sanger lived in. And so uh, two years before she was born, uh, there was a Ku Klux Klan uh, legislation that was passed federally. And then by the time she was 21 years old and 1900 was the first time all across the United States, married women uh, could own property and retain all of their wages. Uh, by the age she, the time she was 38 years old, um, she actually uh, was able to contribute to history, uh, winning a landmark case uh, to be able to um, tell married couples about contraception um, and birth options. And finally, um, as a part of civil rights legislation, um, at an old age of 86, uh, she was finally able to see a Voting Rights Act uh, passed, a voting rights bill passed that would ensure all Americans, uh, including African Americans, uh, would have the unmitigated right to vote. Um, so that's a little bit what I shared, and that's who I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Thank you. All right, right, Reverend 
Frank W. Johnson. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Frank Johnson. I am, uh, I guess what you would call an environmental activist. Um, the part that I reviewed last night, uh, I was talking about Margaret Sanger's legacy and how it affects us now uh, and how basically her attitudes uh, and the things that she talked about, <laughs> and the things that she actually, her belief actually still with us now and it affects us um, with health disparities, how we're treated in hospitals. Uh, just the overall attitude about the health and well-being of all Black people. And just these simple actions, these simple thoughts, you know, actually in so many ways became law. It became uh, ways that doctors think about Black bodies and the way that we're treated in so many different ways. So mm -hmm. just a short overview of what I had. I'll try not to say too much tonight. So, <laughs> Okay. Well, we want you to be engaging. We want you to be engaging um, tonight. So with that being said, I want to start with the umbrella conversation, which is eugenics. Um, I want you to weigh in, you three, on what your view, what your understanding of eugenics is and how you think it played in American society that also influenced Margaret Sanger. Okay, we'll start with, with you, Frank. Oh, well, I mean, with eugenics, I mean, that's an interesting word, I mean, I think um, the way I think of it is that you attempt, you attempt to control a population of people. Um, you would hear so many ex excuses as to why that needs to happen. You know, we hear things about like, uh, there's not enough resources, which we know is not true. Uh, but um, honestly, it's just the incessant need to control a particular population of people that you don't like, uh, that you don't uh, think deserve to actually exist on this planet. And so much uh, of American history is actually based on that. I mean, we're talking about a country who kicked everything off with genocide. You know, I mean, these people uh, gave sheets that they knew were infested with smallpox. They gave it to the Native American communities. You know, they knew that that was going to spread. And when that didn't kill, kill them all off, they uh, introduced alcohol, you know, into that population. And, you know, uh, it's something about the constitution of uh, Native peoples where their bodies really can't deal with alcohol that much. And so it has just, I mean, look what it has done to that population. I mean, even now, so many people in that native population are still suffering with depression. Look at the places that they have to live on reservations. Those are not healthy uh, places to live. And then as you're doing that, I mean, in Canada, what was that last year? They're still discovering uh, mass graves from the schools that they actually put native peoples in and did all types of stuff to these people. And now we're still finding the mass graves. And I'm talking about mass, you know, churches and stuff that were supported by the Catholic church. You know, I mean, th th there's, there's their religion in that. And then, you know, you kick it off like that and then you enslave a whole race of people, you know, to, sh uh, what is it, chattel slavery. That, yeah. means, yeah, that means slavery based on your skin color from birth. So I mean, the whole notion of them controlling a population, that's just inbred on this population. I mean, and we can go as far as to talk about um, our influence on uh, Adolf Hitler. You know, most people don't know that um, to set up those uh, laws against those, the uh, Jewish population in Germany, they came to the United States and studied Jim Crow. They studied the uh, chemicals that we use to uh, kill people you know, to uh, uh, put people to death. So they learned from us, you know, the Nazis learned from us. And when we talk about white society, slavery and uh, what happened in Germany was not an isolated incident. You know, we got, uh, what was that, um, the guy in the uh, Congo, Cecil, uh, Cecil Rhodes. Uh, yeah. I think he, uh, half the population of the Congo, they went from what, 20 million people to 10 in just 10 years. So this was not just a weird thing that happened you know, just a random thing that happened. When we talk about European history, we're talking about the Dutch, we're talking about uh, Europe, we're talking about France. They all played a part in this because they felt the need to control populations of people and, and in particular black and brown populations of people. Thank you, Frank, thank you very much. All right, Ashley, I want you to weigh in on eugenics, your point of view and how you think it has impacted and more importantly shaped Margaret Sanger since you talked about her history. Yes, um, Frank pretty much said it, it all, but um, I will no, no, say- No, no, uh, no, he didn't say it all. I want, I want to hear your point of view. I'm, I'm gonna push you all tonight. I'm gonna push you all. <laughs> um, I will say, um, I think that um, when you think about eugenics, you think about basically this whole like desirable 
desirable population of desirable traits like who gets to define what those traits are who who's the who's the people that get to define like this this population is better or these traits are better or these attributes are better and so when we look at the history we know that it's rooted in basically white white men making these decisions so it all traces back to white supremacy white male supremacy and um the what Margaret Sanger, her her viewpoints and her tying it in, I think that, you know, even though we saw that we talked yesterday about how she believed that abortion should be a viable option for life saving, life saving circumstances, we know that a lot of people pushed the abortion issue because of this same theory of eugenics and believing that, you know, certain people shouldn't give birth or sh certain people shouldn't have the options to give birth in a way that they desire or how many of uh, how many children they want to have, you know, it's all about control and just really trying to, I don't know, white supremacy taking over and white male supremacy deciding who gets to run the world, who gets to be a part of the world. But it, it's just been a long cycle and a, a history that's trickled down. And we just have to keep having these conversations to figure out how to break this cycle. Thank you, Ashley. All right, Keyshawn, I'm going to throw it to you because you definitely have tapped into the legislative end of it, going all the way back to the founders of this country. But predating um, the colonies, where does eugenics kind of play into the world society? And then also, how did it find its way to our shores? So uh, let's see. Um, I mean, you can go back uh, as far as you'd like uh, in human history. Um, if you want to start uh, in Europe, uh, there's been uh, multiple regimes who've made the claim that their race uh, and who they are is what should uh, what should populate the rest of the world. Um, mm -hmm. And so if, if you can go back to um, Napoleon or Athens, it, it, you can go as far as back as you would like. But eugenicists, the ideology itself is defining everyone outside of what you represent as inferior um, and deciding to ally yourself with those who are similar um, and almost exact replicas of who you are. Um, so if, if you have uh, a wide nose and your, your family does uh, and other people don't, you decide um, that they're inferior. Um, and so make you, you have a, uh, a way to delineate who matters and who doesn't, which is a version of casteism, which is a version um, of genocide. Um, and so at the core, um, it's choosing to de define who matters, uh, who should exist and who shouldn't uh, based on their opposition to what you represent. Um, and a lot of times it's physical. Um, if you wanna go to the Aryans, uh, it was blonde hair and blue eyes. If you want to go to the Americas, um, it's pale white skin and Anglo-Saxon history. Um, if you want to go to uh, today, it's, it's billionaires uh, versus the poor and marginalized. Um, so eugenics uh, is a foundation, uh, but uh, it's manifested in a lot of different ways. Thank you so much. I wanted you to, I'm glad he stretched it because it does bring us more into the conversation with Margaret Sanger and what her conversation from her quote that um, our that Mr. Dandridge read earlier, which was the elephant in the room, is that she was for eugenics in its base of the unfit, dealing with deformity, dealing with those things that they felt made their race lesser, and that if it was based upon those types of issues, she was pro eugenics. But then she, but she paused at the line of, oh no, but I'm not saying based on religion or your ethnicity. However, when you're in a position of power, you may include those things in what is considering unfit. So that's one of the reasons why when she began to um, dance that thin line and, and going to Ashley's point about, I believe that I agree with you that her motivation for getting into this work was on the death of her mom and probably other women, because let's put it in the cultural, and I think we've discussed this yesterday, 
within the culture of a European society, a lot of their women did not live long lives because of the childbearing and because of the corsets and because of a lot of repressive um, society demands. And when it came to childbearing, they had difficulty bearing children. And in the cases that they did, understand in white male powered positions, everyone was supposed to have children in order to do what? To broaden their race. Even, even indigenous people, black people, people around the world, of course, this has been world domination. It was always about creating enough people for labor. Um, I bring that in because it's going to dance to the, the parallel of when we get into population control, <laughs> which is what we're talking about. And you've already brought in the fact about the billionaires with the uh, marginalized. Um, but Margaret Sanger's more specifically, she was dancing the line. And I think this is going to the point of why did she meet with the women that were related to or connected to the KKK within the confines of her mission? Um, I'm going to jump, jump that to you, Ashley. Why did she, in your opinion, based on her motivation, meet with the daughters that were connected to um, the KKK? Yeah, so... Um, one one thought around it is that she would probably meet with anyone that would listen to her because she was so adamant about pressing her issue. Um, and so that's also like I think Planned Parenthood, they that's one of the things that they talk about. Like she she would she would, you know, give anybody the space to listen. But also I think that as a person, you have to you have to somewhat feel aligned or you have to have some sense of connection to a group of people in order to go and to talk to them like you have to be comfortable to be in that space mm -hmm. and so the fact that she was comfortable enough to be in that space is problematic you know regardless of what her mission was what her goal was um you know that's one of the things that they say well she would talk to anybody that would listen but you know if I don't feel like I, I, I wouldn't go talk to a KKK group, you know, like if I don't feel like I can somehow identify with you or I, I can be comfortable enough in your space to speak with you, then that's something that I just, I don't think that, you know, you can justify doing regardless of your motivation. I agree with you, Ashley, that she was like, I'm just trying to help women. <laughs> you know, any woman of any make model, that's who I'm here to help, even if the information she was providing was also going to be turned around. Like, oh, well, we can apply this to us, to the slaves or to the free, newly free slaves, to the, you know, in the Jim Crow South. Um, Kishan, what's your thoughts on that, on her meeting with the Klan? And, and, and specifically, we're, we're saying she meet with the Klan, but she really met with like the, the wives, the daughters. You know, you know, I don't think she met with the dudes <laughs> They're saying, hey, we need to have them contraceptive because it goes against even their philosophy on. Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to let you gentlemen lead yeah, into so, that. Uh, based on the time uh, period and uh, the reign of terror that the KKK um, had and the hold that they had on the United States as a presence. Um, I believe it's a proximity to power uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so though she did not meet with the, the male counterparts, uh, uh, if, you know, in a egalitarian way, uh, women lead um, how the household, right? And so uh, no matter uh, who the man is, uh, when it comes to ideas and influence in the household, uh, the woman uh, steers a lot of that conversation. Um, and so, uh, though legally they didn't have much power, uh, those conversations at home, uh, they could shift anything. Um, and as we know about history, women hold up all movements, right? Mm -hmm. And so that power is undeniable. And, and so if you want proximity to the people who have the most power, uh, who would you speak to? You know, you would speak to their wives, uh, you would speak to uh, those who could uh, steer them one way or another. And so uh, that proximity to power um, is what I believe uh, why she met with them, um, mm -hmm. because uh, if her ideals were to be realized, uh, she would have to 
to get to them first, right? And we see uh, this kind of proximity to uh, white supremacists uh, with politicians in Today, this day and age. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's not a tactic that's new, right? This is a tactic that has been used over uh, and over throughout the history of this country. And um, I believe she was uh, just another uh, person who used that same strategy. Kishan, you have spoken very well, and I'm going to toss it over to Frank because proximity to power, that's an amazing, that's a hashtag, <laughs> tweetable, that's tweetable, proximity to power. So with that being said, how does that contradict white supremacist idea of preserving their race if this white woman is trying to communicate to the women within that culture a right to have contraceptives? Explain that to me. Well, I want to jump in. You, you mentioned a specific name. You mentioned the Daughters of the Confederacy. Is that right? Yeah, I was trying to say the Daughters of the Confederacy. And I was okay. like, ah, yes, thank so you. So the, the Daughters of Confederacy, of the, the Daughters of the Confederacy actually came and became very powerful. Extremely. Yeah, that's true. They, they are responsible for this romanticized view of the uh, Civil War that we deal with right now. The Daughters of, of Confederacy went on a whole mission to just rewrite the whole story of the uh, of the Confederacy, what happened through in, during the Civil War. They got on school boards. They had books uh, that were printed up that actually put the uh, the Confederacy in a good light, romanticized it. That's why we love movies like Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. Yeah. So, so the Daughters of, Confed of the Confederacy were powerful. And probably what Margaret Sanger knew was that if she can get that power behind her of those women to justify, you know, because we all know where, where she was going to center that attention. We know where she was going to center that. She centered, she used their power to center, to focus all of that stuff on Black women. I mean, because that whole movement was just powerful. I mean, they still meet now, the Daughters of Confederacy. Yes, they do. Every year. We don't see them. We don't, you know, I, we see we see them, but we don't hear about them coming. But I think she targeted them because they were so powerful and they would actually get behind that movement and then give it the money that it needed, uh, generate the publicity. Um, Wendy Thomas pulled up some uh, old stuff a few years ago about like the messaging that they were sending to black women during the 50s and the 60s, like, hey, you have all these children, you can't afford it. Hey, let's go on to Planned Parenthood. Who do you think probably was giving Margaret Sanger the money to put those things out? The Daughters of the Confederacy, because they were so powerful. And I believe that's why she went to them. And they still hold a lot of power now. Now, of course, I got to push this. Um, <clears throat> we're saying that her agenda was to eugenics, population control. But as she said, she's motivated by white women having too many children and dying from complications, dying from weakened immune system. So where does her concern for white women continue if you all are gonna change the track so that it was for population control against people of color? This is a, this is a push. I mean, that's, a, that, that, that's the question to be asked. <laughs> Ashley, I'm gonna let you weigh in on that. Either she had concern motivated by her mom or she had an agenda against black women. I think it was some of both. I think her, I think her mom was probably her like initial like starting point. Like that probably was what got her into the work, but that may not be what kept her in the work. You know, um, her motivations could have changed throughout the course of her life. And I think that's probably what happened um, because it became more about um, like her father also was in this work as well. So she kind of grew up. In, into the advocacy type of work or like um, women's rights or things like that. So she grew up with that. But seeing her mom, you know, go through those struggles, I think that's kind of what started the fire. But <laughs> the the ignition source and the lighters, like I think her motivation, her racial motivations is what kept her going and the things that we talked about is what kind of kept it going. Like she probably okay about her mom but i don't know i don't think that is what carried her through okay i'm a, we're gonna be going to the audience real soon so i want you all to start throwing those questions in the chat start throwing those questions in the chat because we want you all to definitely be a part of this conversation but kashan you actually had some legislation you you brought out a point that she won a court case what was that court case we want to make sure we add that into the narrative 
because I think we don't want to make, we don't want to vilify her unnecessarily while of course what she did impacted us. So let's talk about that court case she won. Awesome. Uh, so the court case that she won uh, was originally uh, based out of a law in New York uh, that prevented uh, any information being spread about uh, contraceptives, about abortion, um, and honestly, any birth uh, rights outside of uh, the home uh, being handled by any healthcare professionals, um, and especially not having a clinic, right? And so um, that legislation and those barriers uh, were there initially, um, and she continued to fight them until they were uh, relieved in 19, uh, 1918. Mm. And so uh, 1918, uh, that, those laws were reversed, and she was able to uh, provide that information to married couples uh, at her New York clinic. Uh, that New York clinic would go on to become a Planned Parenthood location um, as well. Okay. Now, with that in mind, just understand that if she was servicing couples, they were Black people. No, they were white couples. Mm -hmm. So I think if I can introduce this, and this is where, where's Ashley? Okay. Uh, we kind of been, um, the, the, the pictures have been moving around. Okay. Um, Frank, Kashan, and, and Ashley, can we possibly blend the two together and say that, yes, they were, they used our Black bodies, men and women, to do the research to their benefit. Because understand that they had to have the trials so that they, it would be safe for them to take the contraceptives. Can we kind of like maybe blend those two together that let's say that the Daughters of the Confederate gave her the funding to push the research so that they could one day, because if, and, and for those who are in this work, I understand that we're not the only ones using Planned Parenthood and that actually that they are the largest recipients. So can we maybe move this conversation and we were the, we were the guinea pigs and they were the benefactors? Are you open to that conversation? Ashley, Deshaun, yes. Frank? Oh yes, I completely agree. One of the things I was typing it in the chat right now, um, we, most of us have done work for nonprofits, right? Mm -hmm. We know how you know, big money gives money to nonprofits. But when that money comes in, it has certain things on it that you can do, that you have to do. I really believe that maybe Margaret Sanger may have started out with great intentions about helping women. But when she got involved, I said maybe, Ari, maybe. <laughs> and that's a, that's a big maybe. Uh, no, we gotta, we gotta add in the fact that she, she, she was impacted as a young woman by her yeah. mother's death. Yeah, and when you start taking money from these people, they're like, no, there it is. We, 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 you know, we, we like what you're doing, but can you focus it on the Negro women? You know, that's probably how those conversations went. Because, I mean, they were doing it then, they still do it now. I mean, how many of us do this nonprofit work and you get all this money, but you really can't help the people that you need to help? All this money in Memphis that comes through, Memphis is what, one of the highest uh, for philo uh, philanthropic giving, but it's getting poorer and poorer. So I really believe that that was the situation that existed then because the power structure, you know, those millionaires then were just like these people now. I mean, they were just more open about it. Yes. it to me, it was, hey, you know, we don't want you looking at our, you know, stool pigeon white women. You know, they're, you know, we're going to do, we, we need to procreate because we need more of the race. You can go over there and put it on those Negro women. <laughs> That's probably how those conversations went. Ashley, Kishan. Yeah, I think um, like historically, black and brown bodies have been used in uh, contraception trials and, you know, uh, pills, IUDs, all of it. Like black and brown bodies were the ones that were tested on. Um, and a lot of people lost their lives because of this, because they didn't, they didn't get it right, you know. So I definitely, you know, it's been, it's been not just, not just with contraception and reproductive health, but it's happening the, right now. Yeah, like in every, in every, you know, everything we could think of, black and brown bodies have always been the ones that have been the experimented on bodies. Kashan? Uh, so for me, I'll just, I mean, it's, it's really all summed up in, in just one thing um, that echoes through the history of this country. Again, uh, there is, there are no incentives to help marginalize people. Right. There are no incentives 
um, to help people, uh, whether they were the enslaved, captured uh, people that they stole from Africa, um, or whether they are um, the people who live in 38109 um, mm. who are impoverished and low wealth. Yeah. There, there, there are no uh, incentives to, to help them, right? And so I believe uh, what Sanger was doing um, was definitely you know, not incentivized for helping black people. You, mm -hmm. there, there, was, there was no impetus uh, for that, uh, for her. Um, you know, what I also do believe is that simultaneously, um, what she did want was more power Ooh, over yes. the course of her life, right? Yes. Um, and so what that looked like uh, in her eye was the power to choose uh, whether she uh, would give, birth and give life or and when right mm -hmm. and so uh that power i believe is 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 what she sought uh to to get because you got to remember she she was 21 years old when married women uh, were able to keep their wages and buy property um and so uh having and more so, let's be clear white, white white married women yes yes, let's, yeah, let's very clear, clear very clear white <laughs> there you go white married women um, at that point. Um, and she was 21 years old. Uh, so she spent most of her young life um, as a part of a, a country uh, and a culture uh, where women were, uh, white women even were disempowered. Um, so I believe, you know, it was a part of uh, gaining more power uh, for white women. Understand that this conversation, oftentimes I think in the 21st century into the 20th century, we think that they were talking to us. They were never talking to us. Though the words women and men, we apply to ourselves. Remember, they did not see us as human. So those pronouns were not including us. So when they say women could keep their earnings, they mean white women could keep their earnings. White women could own land. Um, it was not your grandma or your great grandma, Because <laughs> um, number one, they didn't even own land in many cases um, to or the earnings that they kept, you know, were, were, were not even theirs if they were sharecropping and, and, that, and of that nature. So, um, but do you all think from the quote that when she was fighting for her reputation, where she says, I agree with a government that will allow you to have the choice of not selecting unfit, but she said it was not based on race. Do you all believe that her argument was really her heart? I see. I, For I, me, see some, I, I, oh. I think this you're talking this about a very strategic person, right? This yeah. is this is not. Uh, she wasn't the first person to to want more power for white women uh, in their culture, um, and so uh, the allies uh, that she gained, the the speeches that she gave, everything is curated. Um, this is you know a person uh, that was able to fight laws and, and win cases. Um, yeah. You know, she wasn't your everyday uh, low educated person, right? And so um, at that point in her life, um, in defending her legacy, uh, she knew what not to say, right? Uh, and again, this is yeah. where a lot of civil rights legislation is starting to be passed and uh, mm -hmm. civil rights movement is starting to pick up uh, where, you know, the tone changes. Right, and, and you see it all across America, all across the political landscape, and a lot of you know business leaders as well. You, when when the tide changes, their song changes too. So, yeah. so I believe that this is all something we're witnessing now with the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, when um, we had the the total social unrest uh, of 2020, and how many businesses that have been pursued by, by black leaders, all of a sudden, literally did a Black Lives Matter sale. <laughs> I, I, I do believe that oftentimes, you know, as, as black people in this country and black people in the movement, black people in, in the work for the average person is that the organizations that were founded were founded at a time when there were resources for white people. But how can we reconcile, and I think this is part of what Mr. Dandridge is trying to understand and push us to, but how can we reconcile our working with organizations 
that have history that changes the tune when the music changes. Because I believe, this is me as moderator, that the sanitized um, quotes that you also read on behalf of Planned Parenthood is because the tone has changed. I want y'all to weigh in on that. I want to let Ashley or Frank lead this. Um, I, I yeah. think getting Black leadership into these organizations um, like we need more, we need more black people in those corporate seats. We it, at the head of the organizations, you know, so that we can have some real like kin folk. <laughs> um, but all you know, kin, all, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said some real kin folk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but we we just we got to move. We got to move to the top. We they need our leadership. They need they need our our input, our guidance. You know, black people. We, I mean, this country is built on our backs. You know, so many things that we, so many amenities and necessities that we have today is because of black people. Like we're the some of the smartest people on the planet. Um, but yet, you know, we're we're not the ones that are running the organizations. But we need more leadership because we know that's where the power comes from. So do we turn into a Margaret Sanger in pursuit of power? Frank, go ahead and answer. And I see hands are starting to go up because we're gonna to go to the audience, Frank. Okay, well, I think I'm like you, Christy. I don't buy any of this. I don't because the United States is so good with dressing stuff up. I mean, we, we have a real good talent with making stuff look pretty and it's ugly right, right underneath, underneath the surface. I don't think that this country is even attempting to deal with this racial past. We see mm -hmm. laws and stuff being passed to, so you won't even talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I think that it will lead to something worse than what we're dealing with now because we still absolutely refuse to deal with it. But I think with black people, we have to be on it about what has been done to us. We can no longer Play this little game of, uh, you know, uh, shaking it till you make it or just keeping quiet, you know, um, uh, while they're still lying about this stuff. We have to be honest. And I mean, whether or not they like it or not, because in this country, these people will speak their truth, even if it's a lie. We have all of this truth on our side, but yet we choose to be quiet so many times. And I think that it's just going to take us being blunt and honest and not worrying about white tears, not worrying about white feelings. We mm. push these things down because this stuff has not stopped. You know, this stuff is still going on and we're still suffering. And the longer we, you know, give white people, white women and all these things a pass, these things will continue to happen. And I mean, and if it causes, you know, some stuff to come tumbling down, oh, well, you know, oh, well, because it was built on bad soil and bad ground anyway. You know, now, see, with that being said, though, Frank, and I see, and I saw somebody raise their hand, and Ari, when you're ready to start um, dropping in questions, please let me know so we can add them to the conversation. But are we in a position, though, in this systematic system of racism to even go against it and not work within the system? Like Ashley said, put more Black people in leadership. But like you said, if you break it down at the, to, the, to the knit to the grit, some of this needs to tumble. Yeah, we, I mean, at this point, we still because like, we still have to have yeah. the work of justice in all the areas. Mm -hmm. So, how do we really accomplish our bigger goal? And if let me know, Ari, when you're ready, go ahead. Frank. Okay, I'm ready. So, you want me no, no, just Frank, shout no, out? Let, oh. no, let Frank finish, and then I want okay. you to let me know. Okay, go okay. ahead, Frank. I was well, pushing. I was <laughs> well, I mean, do we work within the system or do we tear it down? Okay, well, let's see. Well, we've been trying to work within the system. Okay. And honestly, I don't even think that we're going to have to tear it down. It's tearing itself down. Ooh, okay. Because look at the lie. Mm -hmm. You know, even, in the, even what happened with the uprisings in 2020, you know, they, they painted streets, they painted walls. But what were we asking for? We were asking for policy changes. We were asking, and they did not pass it. And they did not pass it, and then got upset with us when they didn't pass it, and we refused to just accept the window dressing. You know, we said, you know, uh, one of the things that came out of it was uh, defund the police. They know exactly what that phrase meant, but yes. they 
purposely threw it out there. They, they purposely uh, uh, messed it up. They knew exactly what, what they were doing with that. And so it was like, you gave us all this window dressing, but you didn't even give us a voting rights bill. You know, you did, you're not even protecting uh, voters' rights right now. And I'm not talking about just Republicans either. I'm talking about your good old Democrats. Okay, because see, Margaret Sanger, would, to me, in today's time, are, are the same women who, and I had some friends in that circle, who marched on Washington after Trump's election. And I literally had a friend called me, one of my white allies, and wanted to know, she was very distraught, that more black and brown people were not engaged. And she said, Christy, I know <laughs> if anybody will tell me the truth, you will. And I said, well, it's kind of hard for us to run, jump in the street because you all are now mad that you all elected a man who was very adamant about his behavior, grabbing people by the When we literally have been marching for decades and having to step over black bodies in the street. It's kind of hard for us to join this march when y'all didn't join our march. And then they voted for him. And they voted for him. And then that's where the embarrassment, they got quiet all over again because when the numbers came out, but see, these mm -hmm. are the, but this is the, see, this is what we don't understand where we get caught up in the kitchen. And, you know, I always like to put ourselves back in, in the Django mode where you're in the kitchen hearing the, 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 what's about to go down and, and you're serving the food and they're having these candid conversations. And you're like, but they're not even talking to you. You're just hearing the inside facts. Well, once the facts came out that you voted for him because y'all hated Hillary that much. And then you wanna know why I didn't march. Cause y'all got schisms that has nothing to do with me because I'm still burying my black bodies in the street. So that's the kind of stuff, but in the context of this conversation, when you have white allies who are for their own reasons as Kishan has done it, they're seeking that power. They're looking for the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement. They want their dollar to match their white counterpart. And then yet we have to have an actress make sure Viola gets paid equally too. It's so layered, it's so layered. So how can we within the reproductive justice movement, knowing the history that detrimental things have been done to our bodies. Women were sterilized. And then we wanna be able to trust them with our health today. Let's let's have that conversation. And um, are we getting questions in the, in the chat? I don't um, really ha have anything yet. I think people are kind of processing this information still. Um, so you guys, please drop yeah, Kimberly your questions. Owens. Yeah, Kimberly Owens, did you raise your hand? Cause I did see one hand. Um, what are y'all yeah. thoughts on that? Ashley, Kashawn, Frank? Because we have to work within. We have I want to, to highlight something in the chat. Uh, we have, I think her name is Halima Walker. Said a system built on lies will eventually will eventually crumble. Absolutely. Mm. Halima, would you like to expound on that or share any insight about that for the group, please? Hi everyone. Um, I am best friends with Keyshawn. We've been friends since I was sixteen, um, and I am been able to join this and listen to this discussion. I'm a um, critical care nurse by training, worked in the cardiovascular ICU, and now I'm working in a school nurse with a school that's considered one of the least diverse um, schools in our district because we have a majority black and brown population. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, I'm finally been able to mirror my personal passions with professional interests and Speaking to what you guys are talking about with reproductive rights and protecting our people, um, I feel like I have a personal invested interest in that um, because I myself am a victim of this system that I say is built on lies because it all stops. We're told we care about you. We want you to see, succeed. I'm actually working on my master's at UPenn and I love to hear white people explain black problems to me. Um, it's very interesting um, because I'm like, you guys sit in these classes talking about the Black plight of America and the health disparities in this country. But then when I'm in the field with you and I'm supposed to be recognized as a colleague, I'm fighting tooth and nail for you to just acknowledge that I 
and have the same level of intellect as you. So like a system of lies is a system of complacency and you want me to be your figurehead, but the moment that I push back against your system and, and show the inequities, disparities in it, it becomes an issue. And then I am somehow, you know, considered a threat or considered um, mm. insubordinate or whatever the title may be. And I also like to clarify that I am angry. I'm angry because my, my brain, unfortunately, lets me know every day that I have an unfair um, chance at succeeding in this country every day. I feel like I tell people there's a double consciousness that comes with being black. While there are nursing issues I face, most of my issues are centered around being a black clinician. And so I say it'll crumble because you can, you'll never be able to really truly succeed if your interest in your heart isn't in the right place. That's why the healthcare costs in this country are so high because all of our reimbursements are tied to I mean, all of, our, all of our safety issues are tied to reimbursement. They're all tied to money. They're not actually tied to actually improving patient care in this country. Because if they were, we would start talking about some of the things that impact health disparities, such as access te to technology, access to proper education and training. When you're in high school, like when you're a baby, healthy, healthy eating habits, all of these things that then transition into later on in life, um, as far as, you know, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I have lots of students in my school who are actually right now expecting, and I, you know, ask them what type of medications they're taking, and they say nothing. So you're not, you're, you don't have access to prenatal care. You don't have access to, um, you know, primary care. A lot of my um, Brown students, um, who are undocumented, you know, are afraid to go and seek help because they're afraid of like punitive action. So it, it is really interesting working now at this level, um, having been in acute care in the hospital, in the adult world, and now seeing how a lot of these issues start and manifest just in adolescence. Um, and I feel like our system lends itself towards crumbling. <laughs> so with that being said, I, I want to pose this to you. With you being within this in in the medical world, which is dealing with sexual reproduction and, and the like, how often have you seen black women misrepresented when they fight and seek to advocate for themselves? Um, let's talk about it um, just from my own perspective. I, I came into a school with thirteen hundred students. I'm the only nurse. I came in, um, the systems in place are extremely antiquated for our, for our black and brown students. Um, mm -hmm. And me trying to create some type of system um, efficiency so that we can better serve our students. Um, I, I get told that, you know, I'm too loud, you know? And I actually told one of our, our HR director in particular, who is power hungry and more um, concerned with the hierarchical structure of, um, I guess, the politics behind the school system, instead of really acknowledging what the issue is that I'm trying to solve. And I told her, I said, point blank, I, you know, I don't feel like I'm ever going to put myself in a position where I'm being bullied. So she came to me with a closed door meeting, closed my door, and told me, you know, I heard that you um, said that I was bullying you. And, you know, she was hyper fixated on the fact that I said that she was bullying me instead of actually exploring why I felt bullied. Um, and I kept trying to bring her back to that because it is actually very interesting that you as the director of HR think it's appropriate to have a closed door conversation Correct. with you by yourself. And Correct. just by the nature of your authoritative, authoritative position, it is a form of bullying. And, Correct. you know, I can't, if I come out and I say that, then I'm threatening this white woman and she's going to cry. And, you know, but really you can yeah. sit here and have the audacity to say to me the things that you're saying behind this closed door, knowing it won't leave this room. Um, and I really felt like where do I go? What do I do? Well, who do I turn to when I feel this way? And it's so many of us that feel that way. 
Um, I have a director, my direct supervisor of student services and special education is, is a, a um, assistant. And, and we connect because the director of HR does not directly supervise the nursing staff, but she continues to bypass this very educated, just, just beautiful woman. And, and it's allowed. It is allowed. My direct supervisor is Katrina. It's not the other lady that felt the need to have that closed door meeting with me. And at every instance, she cuts her out of our process. She doesn't copy her unnecessary emails about COVID con um, contact, contact tracing. She, she cuts her out of like necessary um, financial um, emails that have implication for our um, special education. She cuts her out and I just quietly will forward her the message and say, hey, didn't see you copied on this. Because what I plan on doing is creating a paper trail for this mm -hmm. system to be able to fight yes. the system that's being built against her. Um, and, and I think it's just the conscious effort that we have for one another of we're not gonna allow this to happen. Um, and I think that's why I say it'll crumble because you continue to just mess up and put yourself in situations underestimating our power and our intellect and our drive um, and assuming that somehow you're smarter. Um, and that's where people always make their mistake with me. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Kashan, since she is a guest- That's my best friend. Yes, I want you to weigh in on that and connect it Ooh. back again with the overall conversation. Okay, just pose me pose the question to me one more time. But Ari's you know, hand is up. I don't know if you want. I'm sorry. Ari's hand was up, so I didn't want to. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, well, I wanted you just to kind of give a quick summary from what, because since she's your friend, I know you know these conversations. I'm um, kind of tie that back around to the greater conversation we're having tonight about Margaret Sanger, plan, uh, Planned Parenthood, and Black activism within that structure, because she's talking about the same thing within another structure. Yes. Okay. And uh, and so, like I alluded to in the in uh, basically all of my past conversation, um, is that the system and the processes uh, that these white people use um, are not new. Um, the tactics are not new, and they are prevalent in every space that they are present, um, and they're always uh, used in order to subjugate. Uh, black and brown people, uh, people that uh, their eugenist ideals uh, don't attach to and deem as unworthy. Um, and so that leads us to different uh, situations, uh, no matter if it's in healthcare or if it's in business or if it's at plan Planned Parenthood itself, um, you will be uh, subject to different um, events uh, where you will be treated as other um, and you will be treated as less worthy, um, less intelligent, um, and they will use every tactic that has been used um, in the past um, and will be used in the future uh, to, you know, leave us out um, and make us uh, not only feel like we're out of place, but uh, create space for themselves and eliminate space for anyone who's different. Um, and uh, just like Halima said, it's in so many different ways that they do it. Um, it's crossing certain boundaries um, that you shouldn't cross in HR. It's yeah. having conversations you shouldn't have. It's leaving people out of conversations that they should be in. Uh, yeah. It's overstepping uh, boundaries. It's uh, using any force that you have or any way uh, that you know uh, to disempower another person uh, and it's specifically uh, black and brown people in this country. So. Now, of course, Margaret Sanger, her point was, is I'm not doing it because you're black. <laughs> I mean, real talk. And, and, and our current leadership is saying, we disavow her for saying that because she meant it even if she didn't say it. But yet in the same statements, they're saying, and we're gonna work on getting rid of it as well. So if you're a black activist right now, who is working within any organization, and we're just happy to be because you are black activists within this particular organization, speaking about its founder, how can you, Frank and Ashley, reconcile your own activism and encourage other black people to join forces? I'm trying to read the questions, uh, Ari, as well. Ashley, go ahead and jump in, and Ari, after that, we're gonna toss it to you. Um, I think you just have to like 
lead by example and just, you know, be willing to put yourself out there, be an advocate for yourself, for your people. Um, and I think, what was her name? Uh, Kishan's friend? Miss Walker. Yes, everything she was saying, I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like, I haven't been in healthcare that long, but I, I've already seen so much of what she was saying. But, you know, as a patient, you know, you have to advocate for yourself. But even as a nurse, you have to advocate. We have to advocate for our patients all the time. Like, I work in surgery. My patients are asleep. So I'm their advocate. So I think, you know, advocating for, for people and then educating other people so that they are empowered to advocate for themselves. I think that's the key. Thank you. Frank? I think just like Excellent. Ashley, we have to speak out on these things. I think a lot of times too, what we've done too, we've been in these places and we shut up. We just don't talk. We try to just get through it and not, you know, just share with each other about what we're dealing with and what we're going through. You know, um, Halima hit it, you know, so hard. Um, as she was talking, I was just thinking about my sister right before she got sick and how she was appointed to a couple of boards and she got that angry black woman label. 30 something years of nursing experience from cath lab to burn unit to organ donations. I mean, all of these things. And she said how um, she wasn't, she, she had to realize that she was at the table, not because of her expertise, but because she was supposed to be the black woman just to be the black face. And she wasn't supposed to add anything to, to the discussion. And uh, she said, I, and I had never heard my sister mention being called the angry black woman, but I remember her saying it in such a way that I knew that this had been happening a lot. She just hadn't been saying anything about it. And I think that we just have to be honest. We have to do what Halima is doing, you know, talking about this stuff, taking these folks to HR, being public about it, because this silence has almost killed us. And, you know, I think that we have just been going so many years. Oh, I'm just going to get in there and I'm going to do what I got to do. And that stuff is killing us and it's killing those that's coming behind us because they're thinking that they're the only ones that's dealing with it or they're thinking that they're actually doing something wrong to cause it. You know, and that's one thing that, that, that that's killing us right there. We are thinking that we are going through these things. And y'all know how this system can turn things back around on you and have you thinking that you crazy and you the sanest person in the room. We know, we know how these white, we know how these white women act. They will have you, they will have you just all over the place and they doing all the crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm about to cuss. They doing all the crazy stuff. We have to be honest and talk to each other again and just say, hey, that, that's a crazy MF up in their room. Stay your ass away from her. And if she fool with you, take her ass to HR, do this, go to EEOC, get in her ass. Everybody, this is a great I at, at the 8.30 floor. We would have uh, okay. just want to know the 8.30 hour. We want to go and prepare for wrap up, but this is great conversation. Definitely. All right. Uh, and to that point, I want to say that this is why I'm grateful that Mr. Dandridge has us exploring Margaret Sanger because she is indicative of what we see in the Beckys of the world in the workplace today. We see them in the feminist and womanist movements. We see them, you know, your white ally who all of a sudden she tilts her head and the Barbie comes back. I mean, we see it and we have to be aware that it's happening and not be in self-denial and just accept like, okay, her whiteness just kicked in <laughs> and recognize it. And if you're in a good relationship with a person, be able to speak to it, but not internalize it. Like, well, maybe I didn't see that. No, you saw it and it did happen. And like I said, my one friend, she called me and said, if anybody's going to tell her the truth. And I did, I, she gave me, I, she treated me to breakfast and the whole time she was talking, I was eating. <laughs> and I was, I was like, mm, girl, what you said, honey? Yeah. And then I, and when I put my fork down, I, 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 I kind of <laughs> in my most Christy Taylor voice said, we're not going to join that march when y'all didn't join our march and we're still burying black bodies on the ground on the, on the, on the, in the streets. I mean, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. So with that being said, Ari, your hand is up. I hope that those who've been watching and, and joining in, uh, Kimberly Owens, I see your hand again. Please join the conversation. Okay. Your mic. Uh, okay, first of all, this is amazing. I'm gonna keep it on the shorter side um, because you know we're wrapping soon. But so one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite 
people in the world, James Baldwin says, to be a Negro in this country is to be relatively enraged almost all of the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so the expectation for us as Black people um, to tiptoe around the insanity that is white fragility and the concept of white supremacy is enraging, right? On every aspect. And like Halima was speaking about, um, you're just, you're, you're like, where do you turn? Where do you turn? Where do you go? Because you go to the black people that are skin folk, but not kin folk that doesn't work. And then you go, you try to go to the people that pretend to be allies and they have their own agenda because, because they sticking together, um, for the power. So when it comes to, um, reproductive health and justice, my thing is we're expected to be quiet and just um, be so appreciative of what Macedon gave us and not complain or rock the boat. Um, and then on top of that, we have to be appreciative of it. And then we have to work in the confines of a quiet movement. Like we have to recognize the art of war, right? At the same time while we, like we've all spoken about, at the same time while we speak out. And there is this almost impossible balance because how do you stand 10 toes down against a system that as black people that were imported as prisoners of war or that were ravaged as natives, this is our experience. Like this is a part of who we are. We are a part of this horrible system. It is in our DNA, but we also fight it in every aspect of life, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, financially. Um, and I think it could be confusing and emotionally disruptive and those things are not addressed when we're forced to have conversation about if Margaret Sanger was a racist. Duh, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, the, it, it, it's, it's, I'm not gonna use the term I'm using, I'm thinking, but it's like a mind if, and we stay in that place. And I think um, in order to escape that place, the fear that has been bestowed upon us that something will happen if we stand in our full power is what we have to start to dispel because we're gonna carry this load regardless because this is the path that our ancestors have taken. So if the weight is gonna be on our shoulders, we have to do it, learn to do it fearlessly. And even with fear, we connect with the right support within ourselves and with each other to know that everybody is not going to make it. Some people are going to die. We move out of the fear of death or losing things. That's a part of this process. But just like our ancestors paved the way for us to have this conversation legally, we have to pave that way in this shift of energy in the universe that everybody can see is happening right now for the next set of people to where these conversations will be, hey, my grandparents, grandparents, grandparents used to talk about this and it used to not be a thing. So. That's my contribution. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, everybody. This is so beautiful and so wonderful. This is amazing. Uh, and I, I love your voice in this respect that from the generation that from which you are to understand that you are part of the continuation of a long fight and that I wanna give wisdom to us um, as I begin to wrap up is may we also fight with the same grace that our ancestors did. And because in the midst of the fight, we still have to laugh. We still have to have joy. We still have to love. We have to still embrace our, our beauty. Uh, we have to find our joy and our magic. And uh, therein lies the sanity. Therein lies the divinity. Therein lies in the, in the seat of your soul, your power. And that is something no one can ever take away from us, ever. Wow, wow. Thank you so much for that, Christy. Um, I think before we leave, Kimberly Owens Pearson has her hands up. Kimberly, would you like to say anything before we uh, wrap up? I heard Christy call on me a couple of times. I was trying to engage through the chat, um, but oh. I will. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to make the contribution um, that Sanger, of course, was a racist. You got to look at her time period. Um, but Ultimately, I'm in the education system and I see the disparities and the inequities as well. Um, and I think with me understanding that we have to be informed, it's a hindrance when we don't know. And so there is a, a way that most are complicit um, in 
the miseducation and the lack of wanting the authority to speak up and speak out. We have to, one, be informed and educated. And I also think, like, when I'm talking to my seniors there, very timid about all oh, can we still talk about as long as I'm black and I'm alive and I breathe we will always talk about our story we'll talk about us because that's what matters we've been given their narrative for so long you know nothing about you where you come from you just think we were just slaves and that's not true we have given a lot to this country and I just think that our fight is being informed, educated, and agitated. Um, my son just always says, if you're white, you are racist, but you can change. You can help us. If you're not helping, you're not a problem. And that's what I get on my job. I see so many people who are, go um, who have told me, sleep. I, I can sleep by knowing that I can advocate for us, I can stand up for my babies, I know what I know about us and speak on it. It's just, nowadays, everybody wants you to just all go on and, 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 lull, and lull yourself to sleep, it don't matter. Yes, it does. It does matter telling our pains because we're no different from anyone else. And that's my contribution. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. I, I, I have something to say. I, I love, uh, I love Frank, my cousin preacher friend, and uh, I want you to know to always be authentic, preacher. We love you. We embrace you. Be who you are. Okay. We love you now. And hey, what's your name, sir? Jason Pearson. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. So, oh, Bob. Well, Mr. Dandridge, Mr. Dandridge, I, I forgot on, in my closed, um, I don't know if you want each of the fellows because this was their contribution to the world mm -hmm. to have a wrap up sentence or a statement. Um, so, pardon me if I forgot to do that. No problem at all. Would you? Absolutely. All right. So, I'm going to now turn the mic over to Ashley. Then Mr. Kishan Pearson, followed by Frank W. Johnson. Um, for my wrap up sentence, I would just say keep fighting, keep educating yourself, keep empowering others. And eventually, it may not be our lifetime, but eventually we will prevail and we will see everything that we're supposed to get. And our reparations are coming. <laughs> So uh, to wrap up, I would just say uh, this fight is a long fight, uh, that we have to be persistent. Uh, we have to be encouraged. Uh, but most of all, we have to take up space. Uh, so be loud, talk, uh, educate, teach others, uh, take up space in this world. Uh, we deserve it. We own it. Uh, and it's ours. Uh, and so uh, if we're going to teach that, uh, we have to embody that. And so march, yell, uh, give speeches, uh, do whatever it is, is your call to do. Uh, treat people right, uh, heal people uh, in nursing and educate uh, or educate them from the pulpit. Uh, do whatever it takes uh, to take up space uh, in this world and love your black selves. I love you all. Well, I'm just gonna come in here with a few old words. Black folk, you are not the you you are not wretched, you are not evil, you are not cursed, you are beautiful. Love yourselves, learn about yourselves, love each other, smile, have a good time, enjoy yourself. But black folks, you are beautiful, and always believe that. I don't care what anybody tells you. Right. It's, um, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Ari, did you have any parting words? Ari's actually been part of working with the fellows directly, leading up to this moment. Um, my parting words would be, I'm so proud. Like, I feel like a mother hen right now. Um, thank you for the contributions for everyone that participated and had something to say that attended. Thank you, fellows. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> 
Um, I'm just proud and like I put in the chat, this felt, I'm trying not to get emotional. This felt like such a safe place, like that place that Halima was talking about, um, we often don't have when we step outside of this. This felt so beautiful and so safe. This exceeded what I already knew you guys were capable of. Um, I'm looking forward to having an extended version of this conversation. Um, thank you, leadership team. Mr. Dandridge, this vision is looking real <laughs> Sexy. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so thank you for the for the um both honest and intellectual um input and that's what I have. <laughs> I, I wanna actually pick it back off you already of when we were interviewing fellows, we had quite a few interviews and it was something about these three and and we thought we wanted to go one direction. But it was just something about the three in their own separate interviews. They was yielding the same interest and the same concern, and they all brought expertise from other fields and within this field that just worked. And we just like we actually had we broke somebody hard because <laughs> they didn't make because we just didn't feel like it was going to be a good match. And I have to say, you called it out and you was right. And I, I, I just agreed with it because I was like, you know what? I can see what you're talking about. I was thinking about when we were trying to do things like this, how was it going to work? And I have to say to the fellows, Frank, Ashley, and Keyshawn, I really love how you guys gave this information. I have, uh, working for Planned Parenthood for six years, I've traveled all across the country. I've heard people talk about Planned Parenthood history, eugenics, Margaret Sanger, and I, countless ways. And I've even heard it on the Republican side or the anti people side, I mean, I've heard all arguments. I have to say, this is probably one of the most eloquent, elegant, intellectual, Black, American, just all of the above conversations I've ever seen presented in this way. And I really mean that no gas is, no cap as the kids say, um, no cap. I mean, it was really well put together. Y'all really embodied it. And I think that was the, the my goal. I want us to really get a background information. Plus, I'm in a theater show right now. So everything is about the background information. And y'all came with it. And then adding Krista to this, who I knew was going to like bring it right on home. I mean, clearly she's a star. This is what she does on a regular basis. And so great at it. I mean, seriously, you need your, we need the TV show. Maybe you can replace Wendy since she's out getting her things together. I can see that. I can see that. And But you, you were able to take this, not only make this entertaining, but educational, intellectual, and just very like warm and i just so thankful um halima beautiful gym sister keep doing what you're doing um so glad that you was led to be here tonight and, and make your con made your contributions to this conversation you are amazing definitely keep being through i keep you in my prayers um who else am i missing miss betty idris who was in the chats earlier saying some things that kimberly owens pearson miss owens Pearson, thank you so much for coming tonight and sharing your, your experience as well as an educator. We are all educators. So remember, go out and teach. This moment, honestly, to me, is inspired by my grandfather. I was telling a story. He was a civil rights activist and an organizer in the, in the Deep South in the 1950s and 60s. And one of the things I remember from him growing up was we always got a chance to sit at the foot of people who worked in the movement when they came to the house. And they would just story share all the time. I used to hate it because I'm like, how long are we going to be here doing this? But y'all would never guess one night I was sitting down talking to a woman the whole night. And I didn't know till years later that it was Emmett Till's mom in our dining room in the country. And it was just, and she was just a humble lady. They were just talking and cussing up a storm. <laughs> talking about the movement. It was Emmett Till's mom. And I didn't understand what the big hype was. It was because it was somebody every week. You know, every other week or once a month or whatever. And they talked about it like football. It was like the Super Bowl to talk about the movie. They laughed about being on the blacklist. They thought it was funny. They tried to kill us. They couldn't kill us. You know, it was, but you know, and now we're here. So again, thank you for this conversation. Christy, big hats to you. Uh, fellows, bows to you. Ari, guest. And that is a wrap. Love y'all. Love y'all. Good night.